are embarking yet again with that intrepid crew of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701 with Captain Kirk, Spock, and Dr. McCoy and others. And this week, we've got an episode that is finally Montgomery Scott-centric and finally brings back one of my favorite Star Trek tropes and that is the cloud of blinking lights we are talking the lights of zatar and for derby i would love to know back in 1969 what happened to make this episode possible thank you ursa master thank you lord uther thank you warp core fans as we speed our way along to the conclusion of our five-year three-year mission to explore strange new worlds uh, January 31st, 1969 is our start date. Uh, for the second week in a row, second episode, Warp Core fans, we have the director uh, named Herb. We had Herb Wallerstein in our previous installment for That Which Survives. This week we have Herb Kenworth uh, calling the shots, first timer to the Trek family. Uh, he mainly worked in television and he mainly worked with Norman Lear the godfather of uh, sitcom programming in the 70s, 80s, and beyond. Uh, and before he teamed up with Lear, uh, Mr. Kenwith actually directed the very, very first episode of The Young and the Restless for CBS. So he even got his start in daytime soaps. But for the uh, following Star Trek, he was almost exclusively into situation comedies. He worked on the Mary Tyler Moore show, Sanford and Son, Good Times, Different Strokes, Give Me a Break, Bosom Buddies, uh, and and so many more of that of that era. That was his uh, that was his jam. He liked those quick, tight half hour comedies. But here he is doing an hour trek, and we'll talk about whether he was successful or not very shortly. The episode was written by a husband and wife team of Jeremy Tarcher and Sherry Lewis, yes. First thing I thought when I saw the name, uh, it is that Sherry Lewis. She was a Peabody award-winning ventriloquist, puppeteer, children's entertainer, author, and symphony conductor. And she created the world famous sock puppet Lamb Chop for the Captain Kangaroo children's television series in March of 1956. And as I said, she was married to Jay, uh, to Mr. Tarcher, and they ended up uh, co-writing their first and only episode of Star Trek, The Lights of Zatar. Uh, the featured cast included Jan Shatan as Lieutenant Mira Romaine, the apple of Scotty's eye, and one which we will get into now. Gentlemen, we had references to Memory Alpha, we had a smitten Scotty, as Ursa Master suggested. We had lots of glowy lights. Uh, Chapel was back. Uh, and we had some other things that I think Ursa Master and Lord Uther will discuss with us in terms of the, the creepiness factor of this episode. Um, gentlemen, it is indeed a Star Trek tradition, if not trope to have an alien intelligence or being as simulated by 1969 technology and special effects to be a series of blinking lights that could provoke seizures now in, in modern audiences, if not properly worn. Uh, most recently, I think Metamorphosis was the episode that we covered. I think that was all the way back in Warp Core 48 uh, and so forth, where Zephram Cochran was plagued by these on a mysterious planetoid. Um, and so, yes, gentlemen, I, I, I feel like, again, I think as we, as we pull into the, uh, driveway here for the third season, the space dock, if you will, uh, I think they're starting to say, Hey, you know, what's worked for us before. Can we tweak it? Can we give it a, a fresh coat of paint? Uh, is there a formula that could maximize ratings and success for us? And I think that's this episode represents that. We've seen it before. Did we see it better, equal, or worse? That's what we're going to discuss today. 
but as far as as it as it all goes, I do feel like there was just a sense in the writer's room of, yeah, we like doing that one. Metamorphosis, that was a good one. What? How can we? How can we? You know, again, give it a new angle. You know, something. And and this is what they came up with uh, for the lights of Zatar. And you know, to my credit, again, a solid Star Trek. For one thing, they're not snipping at each other, as they were uh, in that which survives. Much more friendly uh, crew crew there, and we got to see the crew. I mean, as a whole, there weren't missing bodies. You know, George Takai wasn't off shooting a John Wayne picture, and Nichelle Nichols was right there at her uh, console. <clears throat> so it again, we're seeing uh, all of our favorites, and they're all doing our favorite things, or are they, uh, gentlemen? Uh, were you blinded by the lights of Zatar? Lord Uther, why don't you take us away on this one this week? Hey, man, I, I, I sent a, a message to my wonderful partners in crime here um, saying I felt like this was a David Lynch episode with all of the, like, zooming, especially where they zoomed right into her eye. I'm like, yes. totally something Lynch would do. He must have seen this episode at some point. Um, it, it had to have happened. I always like when a crew member is smitten besides Kirk for some reason. It feels almost giddy in a sense because we don't get to see that typically, right? And and especially when Scotty is smitten, there's just something about that good old Scottish man, that good old Scottish engineer being in love with something more than his typical drink. So, or his beloved starship, possibly, possibly, right? Um. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about these episodes that, you know, is this something that must be seen in terms of this is must-see Star Trek or, you know, is this something that would turn the masses off? And, and to me, it's just a, it's another good sci-fi episode. I feel like we have a lot of different people involved. Um, you know, it's not in just because I always like to kind of look back here a little bit to get another, you know, like look at the plot summary again. All the, all the players are involved at some point or another, and it's just your typical, hey, like we said before, you know, higher beings, whether it's invading a body or, you know, they're more intelligent until Kirk comes along and then out thinks like the mega computer. and th It's just one of those tropey episodes that we always seem to talk about. You know, but prime directive question, they flush the aliens out and they just kind of disappear. So, I mean... I don't know what's your what's your guys take on that because is that kind of going against prime directive then again it's taken over a crew member here um so I'm, I'm curious to see your thoughts on that along obviously with with our with the episode that's uh that's a good point uh you know it's a first contact in a way so yeah i mean prime directive comes into play but it's an extinct race that's as we see over and over again in Star Trek has somehow ascended from physical form to some other form, whether it's by technology or by, in, in this case, sheer force of will. Um, and it's the whole, you know, your cost to live is too high. Not unlike in Metamorphosis where, you know, our good Ms. Doctor is just like, yeah, okay, I'll become the glowing ball of light um, so I can survive. Uh, and you know, they sort of amalgamate. Uh, and in this case, you get a rejection of that. It's just flipping the script basically where, you know, she wants to remain with Scotty, which kind of makes me wonder if we think about, uh, Wrath of Khan, is Mira the mother of his son that dies in Star Trek II? Uh, so just curious, curiosity there. Um, it was really nice and refreshing and and i have to say it's it's also kind of classy love too it's not just infatuation it's not just like steamy kiss or you know uh very suggestive clothing that makes everybody go oh, oh my um it's <laughs> definitely more of a romantic office romance shared interest it feels very organic and normal and um you know, dare I say, you know, kind of quaint and, and sort of of the era, it would have been considered probably more of a more classical romance than anything. 
you know, where these two genuinely seem to care about each other. And Scotty, you know, without having to say it out loud or without having to show it on screen, is totally right there, ready to lay his life on the line for her. And that, honestly, it was really good romance writing. Um, and, you know, the rest of the crew acts around that. And it did feel very David Lynchy, y um, but at the same time, it also just kind of felt kind of Hitchcockian. You know, where you got that voiceover that kind of led you into the the intrigue and the romance. And then there are all these, like, creepy-type Halloween, almost, moments, which was kind of nice. We watched it right around Halloween, um, where there was real stakes. There was danger. But it wasn't like, it wasn't like Michael Myers' danger. It was sort of like a supernatural-type danger that you know, it was more ethereal and a little less threatening and a little more just kind of spooky. Uh, you know, like, oh, it could kill everyone, but it might not. It did kill everyone in Memory Alpha, but is there a way to do something about that? And then the whole pressure chamber thing, um, which I thought was kind of an easy, easy out. It was also kind of interesting because that's not something we've ever seen before. I, I don't think we've seen it since. Um, and the idea that you could sort of pressurize, you know, an iron lung to, you know, an anti-grav chamber to drive out this alien invasion of a person because it's like, well, they either are going to leave and live or they're going to die with her, uh, seems like kind of an extreme rather than just asking her like, look, either you possibly die in here when we do this or, you know, you live with what they're going to do and there's like no choice. There's no time for a choice. The urgency wasn't quite there in the scene, but the pacing of the episode, I think you still sort of felt it and you felt that kind of danger aspect. Now granted, you know, with the equipment, the special effects of the time, like I don't think it's exactly how they wanted it to play out, but man, I was engaged. You know, I got to say like, this is probably the first time all season that, I felt like I was watching a really good episode of Star Trek. Um, despite the fact that it's a little hokey at times, you know, blinking lights in, in space, like, yeah, all right. But you know what? Like, that's that's the era. And it, and it was actually pretty decent uh, overall. Um, I, I think this is another one where you want more from the episode, right? You You kind of want it to be an hour long episode as opposed to, you know, the, the 30 minutes or so we get, uh, because there's a lot more they could, they could do. It felt like a bigger playground than they had time to squeeze in. Um, I'm not saying this, this could have made a Star Trek movie necessarily, but if ever this was adapted for a modern Star Trek series, which I think it easily could be a, you know, a revival episode, maybe not lower decks, but maybe in a Star Trek legacy format where a similar event takes place, this could be one that would benefit not only from modern day technology in terms of special effects, but the storytelling aspect would really give you an opportunity to paint out that crew in a next gen way um, that could kind of help. This is a, a season one type episode for a Star Trek legacy series in my mind. Like you can build up some of your minor characters by giving them this opportunity to be put into peril and come out on the other side okay. Um, so in that respect, I I do see this as a little bit of fundamental, foundational Star Trek. This is one of those tropes that, it's not this exact episode, but this is how Next Gen and Voyager and DS9 all bring up minor supporting characters, is they, they give them this opportunity to be the focal point and to set you know, set the romance up in the four game. So, um, yeah, very successful in my opinion. I, I really enjoyed this episode. I loved the David Lynchian references, uh, that Lord Uther made. And I had not thought about the, the push-ins on the eyes, which was indeed a staple of the first season, at least of peaks. I saw it though, actually from the second and third, well, mostly the third season, uh, when they would have the Zatarians trying to communicate 
and the the characters would kind of have a, an iridescent, unhealthy glow to them, as well as some garbled dialogue. It kind of sounded like uh, Mrs. Palmer. Uh, spoiler for those of you that have not seen Twin Peaks season three, grappling with things inside them that may be otherworldly or otherwise sinister. Uh, and, and so that, that very much as a visual frame of reference, uh, I thought, oh yeah, he's right. He's absolutely right with the Lynchian comments there. So, um, wasn't Scotty, was he smitten in the Jack the Ripper episode? Am I misremembering Wolf in the Fold? We've seen Scott before kind of show some, you know, attention, if you will. I think what, what separates this one from some of the other, uh, dalliances uh, is like it kind of annoys the crew, right? There are a couple of instances where Kirk's looking over, like Mr. Scott, can you get to your station, please? Uh, or like he's like, I'm going to go with her to sick bay. No, you're not. You're going to stay on duty and <laughs> stay on the bridge and do what I do what I tell you to do. And even when he comes down to McCoy, McCoy's like, Scotty, are you sick? He's like, Oh no, I'm just here to check on the last. And McCoy's like, Oh well, the sooner I can do my job, the sooner. <laughs> So it was kind of that workplace romance where people were forced to acknowledge it. And they were just kind of like, again, we had different HR standards probably in 1969. But you could just tell, like, you know, it's like, really? Come on. Like, you're our engineer. We've got a mission out here. There's someone's trying to kill us. We need your expertise. Can't be sitting there like, you know, uh, a moonstruck young cadet. I, I liked Kirk's line where he goes, well, if you're in sick bay, does that mean McCoy's in engineering? Like it's, Kirk's just like, go back to your posts is what he was pretty much saying. <laughs> like, what's going on down there? I got the doctor running engineering and the engineer running the, you know, the, the infirmary there. Like, come on. So I thought that was good. Yeah, there, he, there are a couple of he, he asked Scotty, he says, is she all right? And Scotty's like, oh, she'll be fine. He's like, well, good. Then you and Dr. McCoy agree. You know, it's just, yeah, there's a certain exasperation. I think that that was well played. I do think the whole, like, this is the first time everybody on the enterprise is in agreement was just, uh, like, where was the, this is the chemistry we get in the movies that like, you know, especially coming from the episode where everybody's sort of at each other's throats for some weird reason this is exactly what I've kind of been waiting to see is like Scotty and the whole crew sort of interacting in this more jovial jocular terms that like, you know, it, it, it reminded me a lot of Star Trek three, Star Trek four, Star Trek five, Star Trek six, um, and some, some Rathacon too, but like in the sense that we finally dialed in as a crew where it's fun again. You know, they they just didn't have that uh, typical Desi Lou but um boop 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 at the end, which I'm glad it wasn't there because it would have kind of cheapened the moment. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, like I can, I can almost hear it, and that's sort of the implication. Like, ah, uh, it was, I, I it was so enjoyable to watch this episode because I feel like season three has taken us on this ride, and we're kind of on an upturn. You know, the last few episodes have been pretty good, um, but this this definitely is the first one this season where I've been like, despite some of the goofiness around the situation, it, it really comes off fantastic. And I hit stop. Uh, so we can upload quickly. Okay, can you hear me? I can yeah. hear you. Just let it let it upload before you cl okay, clear well, your says, browser, and we says, should be okay. Learn more or refresh.